Okay, thank you everybody for being here to this afternoon for the Government Ops Committee. And we're uh, continuing our discussion uh, of the recommendations that we received from the, uh, from the uh, police task force that the mayor put together um, that are dealing with the police advisory committee and some other recommendations as well. Um, we did send out the minutes. So if you saw the minutes from the last meeting, if um, we can go ahead and get a motion to approve those. We do have a quorum here with uh, Patrick Davenport, Commissioner T Patrick Davenport, Commissioner Tim Denson, and uh, Commissioner Melissa Link is um, is um, had, has some uh, is helping her mom do some things. So we hope the best for for her mom. So um, okay, a, a motion to approve the minutes. If somebody could uh, make that, we'll go ahead and get started. So moved. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, second by Commissioner Denson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. So today, you know, um, we start off this meeting or we start off this uh, these sessions by hearing from the from the Citizens Task Force group. Uh, we then sub subsequently heard about some different models that different communities are doing. Uh, today, we're going to hear uh, from from um, Sherry uh, on some some legal legal things that we need to be mindful of, and I know Chief Sproul also wanted to uh, share with us some information about uh, uh, complaints uh, that uh, I think he's been updated for for the previous year. So, Sherry, uh, we're going to turn it over to you and share if you can give us a high level of some points that you want to point out to us. That would be great. great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. It's exciting to see you all again and to uh, talk about this subject because I, I think it's really exciting work, but it, it's, it's really complex work. So I did submit a memorandum to everyone about some of the issues that we're going to discuss today, and I'm, I'm very happy to discuss them in more detail. I don't think that there's anything that's particularly surprising, um, and a lot of it was already discussed with the task force in their meetings, but I'm going to try to go through it at a high level. What I also think is important to recognize is that while the task force was developing um, you know, the recommendations, they also drafted a ordinance based on the Madison, Wisconsin ordinance primarily. And their work on that ordinance mostly stopped in October. So I believe that you all have received a draft of that ordinance. And if you haven't, I apologize um, because of the FTP, being, FTP site being down because of the IT failure we had. Josh and I weren't entirely sure if you all had received that or not. But in either case, um, I wanted to, to indicate that the draft ordinance that they had worked on um, does not reflect all of the changes that they made in their recommendations. So I wrote the memo to speak to both of those things, um, but it may be that that you all would just want to focus on their recommendations rather than the draft ordinance because um, it just hadn't been updated for a while. So bearing that in mind, um, the, the first issue, and I think this is one of the most hotly contested issues with the task force, was where where is this uh, auditor monitor, where is this board basically going to live within the government? And, you know, there were a lot of concerns about whether it should be under the manager's office or whether it could be a charter officer. And, and as, as you've seen in my uh, memorandum, I think, you know, my, my advice and Judd's advice, and we've talked about this really extensively, is that we don't think it could be a charter officer unless there was a legislative act, which I think we all know is very unlikely. And so then the options, you know, we think theoretically it could be under, it could be made the auditor's role um, that you know she could then have support staff who assist her, but in the same way that the that we wouldn't try to create a department that then answers to the attorney's office, we wouldn't typically create a department that answers to another constitutional officer without that being done within the charter. And so that's why Judd and I felt that you know if you were going to provide new duties to the auditor, that that would be reasonable under the ordinance, but that sort of warehousing this uh, other department underneath that would, would likely violate the uh, model, the form of our government, which is a, a manager centered, uh, um, a strong manager form of government. So our advice is that it would be most appropriate for it to be under the manager's office, um, especially as the manager's office does have control over the police department. Um, you know, I think it's within the design, the structure of our form of government. So, so I'm not speaking to that as a policy matter. I'm speaking to it as a, as a, how our government is designed. I think it would fit the best there, but I tried to outline options within the memo for you all to consider. 
the, the second point that I wanted to mention um, is in terms of the, the draft ordinance that the task force created, especially there were a lot of restrictions about how the auditor monitor would be hired, um, whether the board would have input in that. And so I just wanted to make sure it was very clear that we, we would need to consult with HR because we do have a lot of personnel policies that we'd want to make sure that we're following. It just, it while there, there is at least one other board that has the, the ability to hire independent staff, um, it, it's a little bit different than bringing on someone who might be a, a new department head or, or that kind of level of staff within the government. So I just would want to reach out to, to HR and involve them if that's the way that um, the body wants to move forward. Um, what, again, excuse me, Sherry, what other board is there? There's the tax assessors, but that's that's constitutional. What's the what's the other one? I'm, I'm the one I can think of is the Oconee Rivers Greenway Commission. Um, they do, in the ordinance, have the authority to hire their own staff. But I think when we've talked about things like that, it's usually like hiring a secretary or someone who can assist with the administrative actions of the board, um, as opposed to creating like a whole new department that answers to a board. Does that make sense? It does. And I think the Cultural Affairs Commission is able to do that as well. Right. Yeah, that's that's a perfect example. So again, I just I think it's a little bit different than what the task force was intending to create, you know, then as opposed to an advisory board that just also happens to have some 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 staff that assists it. Um, Let me ask you. I'm sorry to ask you one more question. And 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 as you're discussing this, did are you taking into account to the other task force that the mayor put together for the criminal justice task force? Because I think there is some. Or, or I, I, believe, I don't know if there if there's support staff there for that or not, um, and how it how it could or might could relate to this. I'm I'm not sure. So I was not taking that into consideration in drafting this memo, and I don't know if Josh could speak to that at this point. I, we did discuss mm -hmm. that and whether there might be an opportunity to integrate, but I think Josh maybe can speak to it a little better than I can. Okay, or you may want to finish your presentation, then we'll go to Josh if you want to do that. So. Yeah, that, that's perfect. Oh, and Patrick, so, Patrick may have had a question. Yes, I have a question. Um, could we, so the auditor and monitor have to go through the legislator, um, um, our legislative body, but could we create, because we, we have this charter system, um, could we create a new position under, within the auditor's office to work with our police department? Did I say that right? No, I, I totally understand what you're asking. J Judd and I think we could not create a new position because um, the auditor is is a constitutional officer with a prescribed role. So I think you know her role is is outlined by the ordinance. So I think we could expand her role by giving her this this uh, re this um, responsibility by making her the auditor monitor, and then how she achieves that through the use of staff would be a separate question and completely appropriate. Um, but I think that, and, and like I said, I've talked about this kind of extensively because we're wrestling with the same questions as, you know, we don't think you could create a sub department under the auditor without going through the legislative uh, assembly. Sorry, if that's confusing. Okay. So, so yeah. sorry, sure. Yeah. Okay. So just 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 to clarify for for all of us and then anybody who might be watching. So, from y'all's advice as going through here is that really the two clear options that we could do without having to go to the general assembly would be either to place this technically under the manager's oversight, like everything else, or officially making the auditor, our, our our charter officer auditor, the auditor that is thought of within this hybrid um, form here. That's correct, right? Those are the two options that you're kind of saying that we have legal avenues to pursue right now. That's correct. Okay, 
Um, so the next thing I think speaks a little bit more to the draft ordinance that the task force put together, which is that if you have not seen it, it is a very, very extensive and very, very detailed. And so one of the things that I had expressed to the task force and I would share with you all is that if you were interested in adopting a similar document, that it would be worth considering breaking that out um, so that there's really a, a bylaws document that has all of that high level of detail. And then the ordinance is really limited to those, those, those necessary things to achieve the formation, which would also place it in line with the other ordinances that we have that create things like the Oconee Rivers Greenway Commission and, uh, and other similar groups. Um, so, so that was just something to, to make sure that the board has some flexibility moving forward and also to, to make this process easier for everyone. The next big issue, and this, this truly is an issue that I don't have a great answer for, um, and that's the access to records. And that's something we, we talked about a lot with the task force, and I think we got into that a little bit last, last month. But, but the issue is that there is no Open Records Act exception that says that a task force can receive records from the police, sorry, so one, that they can receive records from the police department that are otherwise confidential, and two, that once they have them in their possession, that they can withhold them from the public. And so our concern is that if, well, there actually, there actually there's multiple concerns. One, I would say that it does not appear that the commission has the authority to force the police department to release information unless the mayor and commission are engaging in their own individual exception or investigation, excuse me, um, which is authorized by the charter for, for them to do. We, Judd and I have discussed this and we don't believe that that gives the, the commission the ability to um, basically delegate that authority to another investigating agency. It would have to be something you all directly took on. And so, so first of all, there's, there's that issue. But secondly, even if it was, or even if the police department said, hey, we want to give you this information, which is, I believe, what they would generally wish to be able to do, the problem is, is that once that information is received by this board or the auditor monitor, there are no protections for that information. And so what Judd and I have discussed is that our advice is that the board and the auditor monitor need to be treated as any member of the public in terms of how they access information. Now, that doesn't mean that we, we shouldn't, you know, do everything we can to be more cooperative, to wait fees, which is within the police department's purview. Um, but in terms of what information they are able physically to receive, um, we would suggest that, that they be treated no differently than any other uh, individual. Because the, the concern is that if the police department says, hey, we want to cooperate with you, we're giving you all of this confidential information, please don't share it with anybody. Um, even though they may not want to share it, if someone files an open records request, they're going to have to release it or they're going to you know, face potential, potentially even criminal penalties and certainly civil penalties. And that could have um, really serious repercussions in terms of harming an ongoing police investigation, uh, causing otherwise non-releasable victim information to be released. Um, so those are the things that we really want to consider. And so um, in terms of ways to get around it, I think the most creative um, and most feasible option is for the auditor monitor or the board members to physically come to the police department to view records, but not actually take possession of the records. And at that point, you know, the only thing we'd have to be really concerned about is what information they then write down based on what they viewed. Um, but I, I could see that being a workable solution. Um, you know, alternatively, some of you may not be aware, but the police department already has a process in, in an effort to be transparent and support the news media where they automatically review every single police report for release and it goes into a folder essentially that all the news media have access to. So, I mean, it would be very easy for, um, you know, that to be granted, that access to be granted to someone in this position. The problem is those are only initial incident reports. And those are, those are already releasable to anybody. It's the supplementals, the follow-up, all of the photos, video, audio, things like that, that may not be releasable. And that may really uh, make it difficult for this group to operate um, if the goal of the organization is to investigate criminal activity, um, like criminal cases or alleged criminal cases, uh, shortly after they happen. Um, you know, what I think we've seen is that some organizations, instead of focusing on the underlying criminal case, will instead focus on maybe an IA investigation that happens internally. So 
Um, for example, one of the things that the task force looked at recently, actually, or, or used as an example, was there was an alleged uh, DUI incident where the individual was arrested for DUI and the individual claimed that our officers had used excessive force. And so that is a situation where the IA investigation regarding excessive force would have been closed totally unrelated to the criminal DUI matter. And so that's a situation where I think we could um, have, a, have a board that investigates that IA file without jeopardizing the criminal case. And certainly, Chiefs Rule, if you have additional thoughts on that, I'd, I'd welcome them. Um, but I also understand from working with this task force for the past year that that will lead to very frustrating situations where for instance, we have an officer involved shooting that is closely related to the underlying criminal elements of the case and that release of that information might in some way jeopardize the case or might not even be in PD's possession entirely. It might be part of a GBI investigation that we wouldn't have access to. And if it ever became a point where you know, the police are saying we cannot release this information or all of this information because it might jeopardize an ongoing investigation, um, you know, it certainly will create tension if this group is set up to be able to provide an immediate, like with the intention, I should say, of providing an immediate response to the public over X event when we aren't always able to get the information immediately about that event. I don't know if, if that makes sense or not. Um, so, there, yeah, so I've tried to, tried to explain that as well as I can in this memo, but there's just that tension of how, how do we protect information, but how do we release it, and what are the expectations for this group? Sherry, if I can ask a quick question real quick about, about all of this, and maybe you don't want to offer an opinion, or you might. Um, but, if, you know, if we're looking to get something on the ground rather so sooner than later as far as a police advisory committee, can we not... Can we can we can we get something established that kind of follows a model that we've done before, and then establish that police advisory committee, and maybe they come back to us and tell us what they what they need and how to how to proceed. If if that's you know I I I, I, I get the auditor monitor position, but it does seem real complicated. Um, maybe it's just me, but I'm I'm trying to make sense of all of this. Patrick, you had a question. It looked like. Yeah, um, Sherry or Chief, can you? Okay, so I'm going back over my notes because I'm um, trying to put all this together. Uh, one of the issues that you mentioned was when it comes to criminal investigation that that information cannot be released. But um, one of the recommendations is for this auditor monitor board to work in tandem. So legally, that's just practically impossible. Or... Can, you, uh, can either one of you elaborate on that? I don't know that it's impossible, but it's again speaking to them when they physically are going to possess records. That's the problem. And, and maybe what I should, maybe what would help understand, explain this is that when um, you can imagine, there's lots of other situations where governmental entities or other law enforcement agencies need to get confidential information from our police department. The problem is, is there are specific exceptions that say police can release all that information to them. There is nothing that says that an advisory board can receive that information and, and keep it in confidentiality. And so that's the problem. So I think I think they can work together as long as we're talking about viewing information. But it's it's when they actually are going to take information that we have a problem. Uh, Chief, did you have any interest in weighing in on that? Yeah, first off... Um uh, more often than not, if we have a criminal investigation and we're going to turn it over to GBI, we're going to um, just delay any activity related to our administrative investigation until after that criminal investigation is completed. Because for the exact reasons we're talking about now, we don't want to do anything administratively that is going to hinder or interfere with GBI or any other you know uh, agency that might be investigating us. So we're going to wait to do our investigation until after that is completed. Uh, when we do our administrative investigations, um, the model of, of uh, the citizen advisory that I've seen, if you're gonna use a monitor, would be that monitor would be able to be present, see some of the interviews that take place as part of the administrative investigation, and 
ask questions of the police officer or, or ask questions of the investigator. In other words, if they're sitting outside, they hear an interview, the interviewer comes out, they might say, well, you didn't ask him this, or this seemed to be a concern, you know, and we might go back in and ask him that question. Uh, and so that's the, the role or the involvement that that person would play. But as Sherry mentioned, once they start getting their hands on documents and there's written documents, whether they take notes or whether it's actually physically having a copy of them, it becomes problematic because when someone asks for it, they have no protection. We have a protection because we're the police and there's specific protections that are in place uh, for that very, very reason. The other thing that I will say is, is uh, part of, I think, the confusion or problem is, is that there's a, 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 a kind of a mixture between the auditor monitor and in the investigative model. The investigative model actually investigates case. They have uh, access to materials and then they become sort of an arm of the criminal, I mean, of that process. And so they would have the same exemptions that the police have. That's not what we would, I would recommend or we we're doing here. If we're talking about a monitor auditor model, what they would typically do is wait until the investigation is finished. If they're monitoring, do exactly what I just talked about, view view the interviews or have discussion, view documents even, or look at some of the evidence and ask the questions as we're going through the investigation. But then they would wait until the investigation is completed and, and then, uh, then after 10 days after all of our administrative investigations are completed, they're open to the public anyway. And so they would have uh, access to additional parts of it at that point. I don't know whether that answers helps to explain the situation or not. Chief, Chief I'm gonna ask you, I'm, I'd like to ask you a question. It may be, it may be a difficult question to answer, but I, I'm going to ask it just because of, of, of the things going on this week and, and for the past year. So, so uh, up in, up in uh, Minnesota, you know, and I, I think as this committee is thinking about things, when we, you know, I read an article this week about uh, about uh, George Floyd and the police department, and the first the first write up that they wrote about that um, was was totally different than what was seen on 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 the film. So how do you how do we how do we prevent that from happening? Would a committee, an advisory committee, or an auditor to monitor be able to be able to make sure that the truth gets out there first? You see where I'm going? Well, I, 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 I don't know if you saw that same article or not, but yeah, yeah. I, ab I absolutely do uh, uh, see what you're saying, and I think from a, if we had a, a monitor auditor model, then that monitor would be coming in very early on, sitting down with the police department viewing the body worn camera video, viewing other physical evidence that we made, pictures of physical evidence that we may have collected from the scene and having access to the information through discussion. So they would know what's going on in the investigation. They would uh, have to be in agreement with some kind of signed document to say, look, there, you can't, there's certain things you can and certain things you cannot disclose because it could jeopardize the criminal investigation or the administrative investigation. But even with that, so for example, when we have a police involved shooting, before I release anything to anyone, I have to go through the district attorney and say, hey, this is what we have, this is what's going on. I'm planning on releasing it. Uh, he or she, depending on who's in office at the time, is gonna wanna look at it first. And then they're gonna give me some advice on, you know, what is appropriate to release and what may not be appropriate to release. Uh, so it's a process, but they would be involved. They would get to see things. Um, and then after the fact, they'd be able to say early on, I was monitoring the investigation. They couldn't disclose this piece of information because. Right. And, and they would be able to explain some of the reasons or, or, or reasons why certain things took place. And, you know, the thing is, is they're an independent outside non-biased entity that is looking over the shoulder of the police as we're going through these processes. I think that's what a monitor does. Right. Let me ask you this question, uh, Chief, and probably Sherry as well. And I'm sorry, y'all, if I'm taking up too much of your time with this, but and I know other committee members want to ask questions as well. But 
you know, would a, would a, would a monitor position, could it be similar or maybe the same as, you know, we have the administrative officer. And I think, um, I, I want to say Denny Gallus is that is in that role right now. It may be somebody different at this point in time. Um, but you see where I'm going, Sherry? Could, could, that's appointed by the, I think the mayor, but approved by the mayor and commission. It, because where I'm going with this is, you know, looking at the cases last year or the previous year, there are only 60 incidences. And I don't know how many of those were internal. And Chief, you're going to. I got the information is 48 last year. 48. So where I'm going with this is, is, is you know, the workload at this point in time, uh, hopefully stays low. I don't, you know, we don't want it to go high, but would administrative, would the administrative officer or some way similar to that, appointed by the mayor and approved by the commission, satisfy the role that Chief Sproul is speaking of and, and that you're speaking of, Sherry? You know, I think that's a potential option. I haven't explored that in any kind of detail, but I, and I would think that the mayor and commission could create a, a position, um, trying to think of whether that might run afoul, you know, like, uh, Just just sort of an on-call position, maybe. You know, I don't you know, mm-hmm. when cases arise, like the chief is saying. So. Right. I, th- I think it would make a little bit more sense if it was, again, someone under the manager, because I want to be cautious of the fact that we are a strong manager from a government. I know one of the things that, that Josh and I discussed, as you mentioned, was that you know new position that's coming on related to, um, I think, more policing and, and safety generally uh, might be a good position for this. I think, I think the one thing... Uh, who's, the, who's the administrative officer under at this point in time? So, so it is Denny Gallus is, is the is our uh, administrative hearings officer, and then of course Judge Hope also serves in the role of administrative hearing officer for different types. So Denny Gallus is there for PHO hearings and things with HR, and Judge Hope handles most everything else. Um, I would just have to think about whether it would make sense for that person to take on these different duties. And, and I do think it is fair to say that in talking in the task force, you know, one of the other things that this person is designed to do is to help review policy, um, help look at statistics and try to see if there are trends. Um, so it may be a little bit more than just responding to a particular incident. Right. Well, I, I, kind, of, I kind of would see the, the police advisory committee doing that role. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and the way it was outlined for the Safety and Justice Committee, the position that's going to support that committee that's getting ready to start here uh, shortly, they're, they're going to be doing similar things to what Sherry just shared in terms of data analysis, being proactive and getting out ahead of things. So that's why we do think, you know, and, and you're going to hear Chief talk about a number of, of complaints, that there's an opportunity potentially to pair those two positions together until we figure out what the workload really is. Right. Uh, and so I think that's kind of on the table and would be, uh, you know, in terms of the budget would be one way to do this without having to spend uh, significant money before knowing what the workload is going to be. Okay. Commissioner Denson. Yeah. Um, so I, I had gone through the, um, the official recommendations, like the authorities of these different positions. And I think a lot of, a lot of the concerns were are, are kind of addressed in their in their job roles. So, like under the uh, under the civilian oversight board recommendations, the authorities it, it says you know like review completed investigations, which we're already talking about here, is doable, um, and review uh, public reports conducted and completed by the auditor monitor is under the auditor monitor's job description to create public reports. So knowing that any of those reports are going to have to be created in a manner that can be released to the public. Um, I mean, I think the, the, the one, the one line I think that maybe is what we have to really clarify is which is on both, which it says though the review contra- tra- controversial incidents, such as officer involved shootings, use of force and police response to high profile events, absent a formal complaint. Because that does not necessarily say after the investigation is complete or anything like that. So that one line, to me, is really the only one that we have to kind of find some clarification on how that how those materials will be viewed or obtained, and therefore also released to the public. And so, the, so what I'm, what I'm what I'm saying there is that I think that that situation, even as this job description is lined out and the authorities are lined out that this is going to be happening pretty rarely. 
I think. Hopefully. Um, and I think, as Chief's numbers showed, it is it is rarely. And so I, I, I because of that, I do have hope that we could we could use this creative option uh, that Attorney Hines has put in here, which is would be that they could be viewing documents held by the police without actually taking possession of them, and that there's no expectation to me in this recommendation that the civilian oversight board members would be doing that. To me, there's no expectation that it would be the one person, the auditor, monitor, and then that auditor, monitor would, as uh, as it states here, um, would pre prepare and file a public report for the civilian oversight board. Um, so I, I think this is I think this is obviously a one of those situations we do have to figure out. But I I don't read this as being uh, so difficult that we can't find a way within the recommendation to move forward um, and have and have this work. Yeah. And, and I, I don't necessarily do either, Commissioner. Mason. I'm just trying to wrap my head around the order to monitor position and how that is going to work. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Commissioner Edwards. You, you, something's on my screen blocking you there. Hey, uh, so I guess we're concerned about the reports the auditor monitor would create based on non public investigative information. Is that sort of the crux of the issue here, Chief and Jerry? I think that's part of it. Uh, um, I think it's also about setting expectations because, you know, if, if we're talking, and I probably should have explained this a little bit better earlier, especially for those watching uh, remotely, that when we're talking about a case being closed, there are really different <laughs> concepts of when that happens. So when we're talking about IA investigations, and we have the closure that the chief mentioned where everything's releasable within 10 days after it's closed. And that is absolutely true and, and easy because those are generally closed within 30 to 60 days, probably. But when we're talking about a criminal case, the police are going to close their investigation at some point, maybe three months, two months, six months, you know, whatever it is after an incident occurs. But that case is not considered closed for the purposes of the Open Records Act until final resolution of that case, which generally means until all appeals have been exhausted, which, you know, could be three years or five years. And so what I basically didn't want is for the mayor and commission to think that this group would be able to go ahead and, and really dig into incidents of, of criminal behavior, criminal cases, um, and, and have access to the full file when the police have closed their case. Because, you know, while the police could certainly waive that exception and release it, the problem then is that is entirely released to anybody then, or potentially could be. And I know the district attorney's office is going to have really strong opinions about that. Is there, uh, is, there, it, so. is there a danger of having the case file accessible to the auditor monitor, but just not have an expectation for the auditor monitor to produce a report based on that? So I think it once, it, it, wow, I think it depends on what you mean by access. If it's that, like the, I was thinking, you know, I was thinking about how, like, when the auditor monitor might be present for uh, interviews conducted in an IA investigation. So you could have the auditor and monitor present, but they would not create a written report that would become a public document. Right. So it, it really just depends. I mean, if, if all that person is is present and they're not taking notes, I mean, the moment they create a note, a record, an email, a text, anything that could be a document, considered a record or document under right. the Open Records Act, that's that's a problem. Right. Um, if they're just coming in and viewing and not creating records, that's totally fine. If if they're getting a physical copy of a file, that's the problem. The other the other problem there is is once they have viewed that evidence or pictures or listened to the statement, then there'd have to be some limitation on how much information or what they would be able to then go back and release because that could hinder the ongoing investigation. Could you have them sign a non-disclosure, Attorney Hines? No, because because that's the problem. It, it's not effective. I mean, they're a government entity that's going to be accessing government records. They don't have the right to agree not to release those records to the public. If they that have them in their possession. If but they if have they them in their possession or if they've created any notes that contain that information. But I'm saying just if they viewed them, not if they that's took right. them. Yeah, no. 
the Open Records Act doesn't require people to write down what they've observed or heard. Uh, you know, obviously. <laughs> what could you request if they created no record? Nothing. The Open Records Act only allows you to request records. Yeah. So if you just had the auditor monitor present mm -hmm. and then maybe had them sign something that they swore not to verbally divulge whatever they saw in this meeting of a confidential investigation. Does, is what, that what, they, what they would be able to walk away with is to be able to say, you know, I'm the independent um, monitor. I was there. I've been watching what's going on. We need to give the police department the time to complete their investigation and I'll be continuing to monitor it throughout. Right. That's, that, that's pretty much the extent of what they would be able to do until right. the case is completed. Is that enough? That's a million dollar question. Is that enough for this committee to recommend for, you know, to have, well, I mean, basically we, we would have this position of trust for an auditor monitor. I mean, I assume if, if an auditor monitor observes something that, that was untoward that they wanted to bring to the attention of the committee that would then trigger the creation of a public document that would be subject to open records. Generally, I think that's the case. Now, I will say there's because, nothing that because would... Because even if it was something as simple as like the chief's, what, he, what the chief just said, imagine the opposite, like a two-sentence... I have concerns about the conduct of this investigation. That would then be a public record, right? Uh, that statement would, certainly. I, I don't think that statement, though, would be a problem. I also would say, would like to encourage you all to think that the auditor monitor could go and verbally relay information to people, uh, so not to like necessarily to a journalist or even necessarily to the board, um, and it would depend on that non-disclosure agreement that we were talking about, but it might absolutely give them the ability to go to the mayor or the mayor and commission. Um, you know, to relay their concerns if if they really did feel that there was a problem. I mean, I'm 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 fine with that, Chair Hamby. I mean, having an auditor monitor present, but not creating any sort of public documents to protect the integrity of the police work. I think that's fine with me. Okay, Commissioner Davenport. I thought I saw your hand up. Yeah, I'm still um, I'm just still mulling it over. Okay. Well, Sherry, unless um, I know the chief had some information he wanted to share with us, unless you um, have some more thoughts on this. Yes. Thanks. Sure. Put summing it up, Chair Hamby, I think just saying, you know, we, ha we have to be very clear creating these, this guidance for the auditor monitor, you know, okay, mm -hmm. under these circumstances, no notes are to be taken, no records, this is a confidential meeting, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Can I ask you if you could write this, write some of this guidance down that we could look at on, on, in writing and, and perhaps go from there? You directed that to me. I'm so sorry. I just missed you for a second. No, I was I was wondering, you know, could you write some of these guidance down that if, that if this is the direction that we are, we are considering just writing something down so that we know what what it is this this would entail? Absolutely. Answer then, questions because. You know, what's sticking out in my mind, too, is Russell, uh, Commissioner Edwards, you raised a question about, you know, if they make the statement to, uh, you know, there are concerns here um, and how, how if they're making, you know, if they do verbally make statements to mayor, commission or other citizen advisory or anybody really, how, how does that, how does that, how does that play in things? I do also need to point out. I'll just try to, for something to stew over. I do also want to point out that there, that there's a you got to make a, a, a differential between a criminal investigation and an administrative investigation, and so in a criminal investigation, uh, which they will uh, an officer if it's a criminal investigation they're going to be told this is a criminal investigation. If that is the case, then that officer has the right to say, I don't want to give a a, a statement in the presence of anyone. You know, they, they can actually ask for their attorney and have the attorney there. They don't have to give a statement at all. Or they can say, I don't want to talk if there's a third party watching this or it's going to have access to this information. So what we're talking about is administrative, not a criminal investigation. Okay. And Sherry, if you could clarify that in, in sort of the description, 
But y'all, what, what I was alluding to earlier with the administrative officer is, and Chief may, may, this is a good segue to the Chief's presentation, you know, there may be a situation where where like a full-time position, I mean, unless it's unless it's doing some work with the other committee, um, I'm just trying to figure out if it if it uh, if it's warranted or if it's if it's if it's sort of an administrative on call sort of sort of thing. If you see where I'm going with that, so Absolutely. Chief Chief uh, Sherry, go ahead. I was just, say just very quickly. I, I don't need to go through the rest of the memo, but I did want to say in terms of the membership piece. And again, this speaks, I think, a little bit to the difference between the recommendations and the ordinance. But the ordinance was based on the Wisconsin model that has really specific information about the racial makeup and the background of this, the individuals. And uh, Josh brought it to my attention that Madison is actually being sued currently, alleging that they are uh, improperly racially, um, I guess, uh, requiring certain people to be on that board. So I just wanted to point that out in case that was something that the GOC was interested in exploring. Was it like an affirmative action suit? Basically a reverse discrimination <laughs> argument. Okay. Commissioner Denson, did you have something to weigh in on? Yeah, just on the on the membership piece of, of the memo, which you know, I, I think um, uh, Sherry went pretty pretty thoroughly through there. I, I, I definitely think there is a need for us to just find uh, flexibility and maybe moving some of these requirements into um, preferences, maybe, you know, um, that are obviously mentioned, uh, but not necessarily um, we're beholden to, because I, I, I think Attorney Hines points out many different situations that we could find and find ourselves in problematic situations. I'm not having quorum, all sorts of stuff. Um, so I, I definitely think we should take the recommendation into advisement, but tweak it from maybe being some of that being requirements to preferences. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry, for your time. And look forward to hearing from you again. So, Chief, um, you've got the floor there. Hey, I'm going to try to be very brief with mine. Um, are you all able to see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, so this comes uh, at the request uh, for more information about the total number of complaints uh, that uh, we're, we're seeing each year. I just want to start by saying uh, this is a uh, what I'm going to share with you today is one of a number of reports that we uh, 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 produce each year uh, in its re in, in regard to requirements from the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies. We are accredited through them. We adhere to about 400 over 400 uh, uh, standards, and one of those standards involves doing uh, a complaint analysis each year. So what I'm, I'm going to be briefly going through with you today is the report that is actually on the manager's desk now for approval for 2020. Just let me uh, say that this is this is our transparency website. As you can see, that there's a complaints and discipline uh, for 19 and 18. So yearly, when we do these reports, we post them for the public to be able to see. And there's not just complaints and discipline. There's bias-based policing. There's early warning system where we're looking at if we have an, an individual officer who's getting multiple complaints of a similar nature or in a short period of time, this system will tell us, you may want to take a look at this guy, you may have a problem here. So uh, we do an early warning system uh, analysis each year. We do look at our grievances, recruitment efforts, whether we're meeting our recruitment goals. Uh, we Every time we use force uh, or every time that we threaten force. So if we pull a gun out and point it at a person in a situation, we document that and there's an annual report that shows uh, those instances and then there's a vehicle uh, pursuit report as well. So those are available on our transparency website and uh, uh, and, and along with the complaints and, and um, analysis. Uh, this one that's uh, from uh, uh, year 2020, uh, during year 2020, we had 48 total complaints uh, uh, against employees. That includes officers and uh, civilian staff. Uh, if you look at the five-year average, we're averaging about 53 per year. This year, we were a little below where we had been in years past, but we had 48 total this year. Of those 48, uh, 33 of those um, complaints came from external sources. Someone, a citizen or somebody outside the police department was the one that made the complaint. 
15 of them or about roughly 30 percent of them were internal complaints, which is where a supervisor, a commander or an employee saw what they felt was a violation of departmental policy and they initiated the complaint against another employee and was investigated um, by the department. Uh, this is just a breakdown of the, um, the types of complaints that came in. So the service complaint is, is that we were supposed to do something and it wasn't done or they didn't like the service that we got. It's a policy violation. Either we have a policy that requires that something happen and it didn't happen or that or prohibits something from happening and they're alleging that it did happen. Uh, criminal, we know what that is, use of force. Now, in use of force, under the complaint category, we, uh, we, we do a separate report, and every time that uses of force take place, we capture that. But this is specifically where people actually complained and said that the uh, force was either unnecessary uh, or it was excessive. Uh, and so we have uh, four of those during the year, and then bias-based policing, where someone is alleging that officers took an action that was specifically motivated uh, because of a bias, race, uh, sex, uh, national origin, or, or that. So of those 48 complaints, 15 of them uh, during the year were classified as unfounded. Unfounded means that when we looked into it, the action that's alleged or what they're alleging did not occur at all. Um, and, and, and by the way, the way that we determine that is by looking at body worn camera video, examining physical evidence, talking to witnesses and doing a thorough investigation. Um, so 15 cases just didn't happen. Uh, in 14 cases, uh, it was determined that the, it was the officer or the employee was exonerated, which means what was alleged actually took place. It happened, but that it was not a violation of departmental policy. Uh, so if somebody said an officer was speeding and ran through a stop sign and they had their lights and siren on, well, the law allows us to do that. And so it, it, they did what it was alleged to have been done, but it's, you know, legal and it's within policy. Uh, so 14 of them were exonerated. Policy review means that when we looked at the allegation, there was really no policy in place that would have guided or dictated what the officer should have done. And we need to go back and look at our policy to add or change our policy so that we cover that and there's clear direction on what our expectation is. And then sustained means that it actually happened and they violated policy. We have 14 instances where um, alleged uh, violations were determined to be sustained and policy was violated. Just want to go back to the 48 um, total complaints that came in. Remember, 33 of them were external. Um, 15 were internal. When you look at the fact that we responded to about 90,000 citizen contacts last year, uh, and, uh, that means that only in about 0.04% of the time that we responded and interacted with the public did we have a complaint that came in. Um, now, when a complaint is sustained, remember we said 14 were sustained, we can handle it one of two ways. One way is through training, coaching, counseling, if it's a low level um, uh, issue or if it's something that person didn't know the policy uh, and, and, and we will handle it through coaching, counseling and training. If it's actually a higher level or if the person should have known and, 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 and violated the policy, then we're gonna handle that through forms of discipline, which includes reprimands, suspensions, demotions and even up to termination. So out of the 14 cases that we had uh, that were sustained, eight of those cases resulted in some form of discipline, which means the other six were handled through training, coaching, counseling, and other uh, through other methods. Uh, and then when we look at what types of uh, discipline took place, um, in six of those cases, a reprimand was handed out. In two of those cases, uh, a suspension took place. When we look back at Previous years, we see that there was 11 total uh, complaints in, in 2017, 17 complaints in 18, and only five last year compared to eight. So we're up from last year, but we're down from the uh, two previous years. Um, and so that's the report uh, in a nutshell. If we were going to use an a, a auditor to try to look at data, uh, to look for patterns or trends, they would be looking at about 
48 cases and really 33 cases because 15 of those 48 were uh, cases that we initiated internally. That was a quick watered down version. I'm, I'm trying to keep everybody on track and be respectful of time, uh, but I'll, I'll certainly answer any questions that folks may have. Chief, how do you uh, how do you deal with the use of force? Who who looks into those uh, complaints? Yeah, well, so we we look into our use of force. What ha what happens if it's it's a if, first if it's a high level shooting or something like that or a uh, allegation of excessive force? Then we're going to have our um, uh, professional standards folks uh, kind of handle that. If it's a shooting, then we would farm it out to um, the Georgia Bureau of Investigations. Uh, anything below that, what happens is the supervisor that is working on that night would respond out. They would look at body worn camera video and they would handle that investigation. If it's something that I look at and I say, well, we need a little bit more than just a, a regular line supervisor looking at it, we would we would uh, have them look into it. Uh, and there's a whole separate report similar to this on use of force. But the majority of those are simply we get a call for a man with a gun or something that involves a weapon. And when our officers arrive on scene, because they're dealing with a situ an unknown situation involving a gun, they're going to take their firearm or a shotgun or a rifle out. And when they do, every time they do that, they're required to report that. And we document that to make sure that, you know, they're not just pulling it out uh, in cases that wouldn't warrant it. Okay. Uh, any committee members have any questions for Chief Sproul? Okay. Well, thank you, Chief. I appreciate you sharing this information and being, being available. You are welcome. Thank you, sir. All right, Josh. We've got a lot of a lot of things to stew on. You're about to give us some more. Yeah. The only thing I have, and knowing we have one minute left, if we had time today, we were going to ask you all to think about the, the four remaining questions that the mayor posed uh, to the task force. And so last meeting, y'all talked about the first three. And so this meeting, uh, we were gonna we were gonna ask y'all to to share your thoughts uh, on the on the last four. Okay. So so here's what they are, and I think you know we're out of time, but uh, we'd love to hear how y'all want to work through these. Well, how about this, uh, committee members? If if Josh, could you email us this slide, and we can we can since uh, Commissioner Denson had to had to scoot out uh, first, and uh, Commissioner Link's not here, and I think they'll be important. Uh, part of this discussion. Um, so could you email us this and we'll bring this up first thing and hopefully at the next meeting we'll be able to get some information back from Sherry to where we can start making some decisions and, and moving this along. We've got we've got parklets to talk about. So uh, and how's that sound committee? Is that good for y'all? Okay. Sounds good. Well thanks everybody for your time. I need a motion to adjourn. So Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Chief. Thanks, Sherry. Thank you all. Have a good night, y'all. Thank all you, right. Gavin.